Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Sugar Science Ask the Expert. I'm Alexis Carmer, and I'm filling in today for Monica. And we're very pleased to have with us today Unique Satoyono. Sato um, she's a PhD candidate from Heiko Likert's lab and will speak about generating future stem cell islet product for islet replacement therapy. Uh, just a short bio, Nike started her studies in Indonesia where she was fascinated with the intersection of biology and medicine. She continued her studies in Dresden where she learned a lot about the biology behind diseases and medical approaches. It's been a passion of hers to work in the field of stem cells for st cell replacement therapy. This aligned perfectly with the aim of the Institute of Diabetes and Regeneration Research led by Professor Heiko Leichert. Their aim is to generate stem cell derived product for future islet replacement therapy that has improved functionality and safety. Before she gets started, I'd like to remind everyone that they can place questions in the chat box during the presentation. Nikkei, thank you for coming. Welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. All right, thanks for the kind introduction, Alexis. Um, and let's just start then. So as Alexis have kindly introduced, like our lab in uh, under Heiko Likert is working on generating future SE islet product for islet replacement therapy. And before we go to the product itself, let me give just a little recap about type 1 diabetes. So what is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease that is characterized by the loss of functional beta cell mass over time. Hyperglycemia that comes as a result of loss of functional beta cell mass can be corrected through exogenous insulin secretion. But um, so in combination with um, continuous blood glucose monitoring and insulin pump, uh, this artificial pancreas is able to relatively compared to before artificial pancreas, maintain the um, normal blood glucose range. Um, yeah, normal blood glucose, like within range. But still, the best uh, possible therapy is basically to replace the B functional beta cell mass that are lost um, that are lost due to the disease. However, we know that human cadaveric pancreas, the donor, is rare, and therefore we need alternative cell source for um, islet replacement therapy. So this review by Brusco nicely summarizes the potential um, cell source for islet replacement therapy. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focusing. I'm going to be focusing on um, the strategies involving SE islet derived product. So the proof of concept of using stem cell derived product for islet replacement therapy uh, was shown by this two uh, publications using basically pancreatic progenitors, which is the middle way uh, between pluripotency and beta cells um, for uh, in transplantation. However, the result was not as promising since the C-peptide generated was very low and they um, there is this inefficiency in generating the mature endocrine cells. And of course, when we're talking about stem cell islet beta cell for therapy, we cannot not talk about the Fertex trial that is currently ongoing. I mean, their latest result showed a great control on blood glucose level and overall a very promising result for uh, stem cell derived beta cells for islet replacement therapy. But to reel it back in and really to talk um, for um, about the limitation of as, as stem cell derived islets for diabetes therapy, we need to go and look at the differentiation process uh, differentiation process itself. So the differentiation process that we are using is basically following the develop the developmental process, which is mostly the knowledge is derived from mouse. And this leads to variable efficiencies, meaning it's not only generating endocrine or pancreatic lineage, but also off-target cells or cells that are not present in adult pancreatic islets, such as this enterochromaffin cells marked by LCC18A1. 
but also it uh, the endocrine cell types that are generated are often immature and non-functional um, so they don't respond too well to glucose challenge Additionally, the, de the development of the differentiation protocol focuses on the generation of beta cells and not alpha uh, and not other cell types that could also help with the beta cell functionality. So here in IDR, we're tackling this um, efficiency problem from multiple different angles. So a couple of years ago, we published a very a specific subpopulation of definitive endoderm. So this is the very early stage after pluripotency that are primed for pancreatic lineage. This showed that there are a degree of patterning happening and even in our differentiation process. And at the moment, we're currently focusing on the later stage of the differentiation, trying to understand the mechanism of the uh, endocrine induction, the alpha beta lineage decision, and attempts on generating defined SE islets for transplantation, and also improvement of beta cell maturation in vitro. So as you can see already that this is a team effort, this is not just me, like these other PhD students have kindly allowed me to also um, share their um, projects. So I hope I do them justice um, explaining their project. So let's start with um, the first one, which is dissecting the in so Toby, um, Tobias, is working on the dissecting the mechanism of endocrine induction and in SE islet differentiation. As we know in development, the NGN3 induction leads to the, um, the NGN3 positive cells basically leads to the exit of these positive cells from the trunk to form the islet clusters. And looking closer on the previously published pseudotime during endocrine induction stage, Toby is focusing on the signals that are also transiently expressed during this period of time. Specifically, he is interested in the role of wind PCP signaling that is marked by CFAP 126, or also known as flat top. And to observe, um, to monitor flat top expression over time, he generated flat top reporter line that is marked by Venus. Here, and then combining it with insulin a C peptide M cherry line. So then we have a double, then he we have a double reporter for flat top and C peptide. So um so this enables like lab monitoring for both flat top expression and C peptide expression over time. This also allows using um that the sorting of the Venus expressing cells. And um, through this transcriptomic analysis showed that this flat top report, uh, flat top positive cells are associated with microtubule reorganization and cell cycle exit. And then Toby is now currently focusing more on the, the really like drilling down to the mechanism on the celiogenesis and how does this interplay leads to endocrine induction and and following the endocrine induction, Melis aims to uh, understand the signaling cues that drives the branching between alpha and beta lineage. So she generated the ARC spots double reporter that marks the ARCs um, report uh, beta cell uh, alpha. Sorry, ARCs marks the alpha cell progenitor, and PAX4 that marks beta cell progenitor. And these life again because this is a reporter line. This allows for tracing over time as well as sorting of these uh, specific population and um, a multi-omics analysis of this sorted population. So she had a, also had a talk just two days ago, so I will not go over all the details, but long story short, through the multi-omics analysis, she uh, um, uncovered basically that, um, or yeah, through the multi-omics analysis and the gene, re re gene regulatory network uncovered, um, the result pointed at the PAX4 being the default ex transcription factors expressed, there, and then upon ARCs activation, the ARCs expression basically drives it to the specification towards alpha cells. And this is also now um, in bioarchive, so feel free to, to take a look and check um, the manuscript. In the mean meantime, I'm focusing more on the later stage. So current differentiation protocol, as I mentioned, 
currently focuses more on the generation of SE beta and often overlooking other islet cell types despite their importance in um, islet functionality because we have this beautiful paracrine signaling that helps with the islet functionality. Uh, and the latest protocol showed that reclustering attempts already improve the functionality of these clusters. The Hebrock lab showed that generation of SC beta only aggregates have a higher insulin secretion. But then we asked the question, would creating an alpha beta islet actually is better for functionality? What would be the ideal SC islet composition? And would this improve the functionality and safety of these SE islets? To help with looking uh, of, to to help with sorting the specific um, cell types, we generate another double reporter line that marks the alpha cell progenitor and therefore alpha cells because ARC's ex expression is retained in alpha cell. And we also have a C peptide uh, reporter line that, so then we have uh, alpha and beta reporter lines. And through the reporter expression, we can sort using the flow cytometry and seed them in different ratios. So we have unsorted that we just leave as is. We have reaggregated that we dissociate and we put back together. And we also have the enriched islet in different ratios of um, alpha, beta, and also beta only. So a week after sorting, you can already see that the enriched islets um, have like a nice run structure. Meanwhile, the reaggregated sum has a little outgrowth here and there as well as the unsorted. And also the main difference that you can see very clearly is that the unsorted are, aggregates are huge. They're almost like around 300 micrometer. Meanwhile, the reaggregated and the enriched ones are roughly around 100 micrometer. When we look closer at the cell composition, we can see that actually the enrichment um, is reducing the amount of anthropomorphic cells that are present in these different um, cell types and these different clusters. Upon quantification, we uh, uh, discovered that actually the unsorted and reaggregated composition is not very different. They're pretty much, um, they're very similar. But importantly, the beta and the beta alpha ratio is maintained even after one week in culture. So, so far we have shown that we are able to generate um, alpha beta clusters with like this specific ratio, but what is, how is their functionality? How um, does they actually perform better? So to answer, to assess the functionality, we do a um, glucose uh, challenge basically. So here we um, expose the different clusters to different um, glucose concentration, low and high. And here I showed you an in insulin stimulation index, meaning the difference between the high and the low glucose, the amount of stimulation, how much insulin, how much more insulin were they able to secrete uh, between low and high glucose. So here the dotted line, I hope you guys can see that, the dotted line marks basically the one fold marking the low glucose. Um, Interestingly, though, when we compare these two non-enriched um, clusters, they, they have a similar composition, but as they reaggregated showed a higher simulation index, suggesting that the size or the reclustering process itself has an impact on the functionality. And when we looked at the enriched uh, population uh, clusters, we all the all the full change numbers are above unsorted. However, only SC beta alpha islets in 70 and 30 ratio um, is have a significant difference compared to unsorted and beta that but not reaggregated. That suggests that the alpha cells might be important for beta cell functionality. So currently we're analyzing uh, the in vivo data and uh, transcriptomic data hopefully coming soon and this will shed the light again to this will shed the light on the functionality and maturity in vivo but also the safety on different assay products and talking about the maturation of these products 
Nicole wanted to explore if there is a mechanism of beta cell maturation that we could utilize in vitro. So this is to better understand beta cells and their maturation process and seeing if there is a, a mechanism that we can utilize to generate a better model for human primary beta cells and potentially to have a more mature product to transplant. So previously in the lab, we have published that flat top, again, um, the one of the wind PCP signaling component, um, marked a more mature beta cell subpopulation in mouse. Nicole is currently exploring if the wind PCP activity in later stage of differentiation showed the same phenotype in human as previously observed in mouse. So during endocrine induction, Toby's result have shown that the wind PCP activity is high and then it decreases over time. Nicole then asked the question, like what happened if you culture them longer and in culturing them in different cell composition? So when she left um, the cells unsorted as is basically, she left that she observed that the inextended culture, the there is no flat top expression observed. And upon reaggregation, we can see a little bit of flat top um, expression here and there. But when we enriched them for uh, beta cells using CD49A surveys antibody, we see a drastic increase in flat top expression. This already indicates that SE islet composition and the cell cell interaction plays a huge role in wind PCP activity and therefore SE beta cell identity. So, following this finding, Nicole ran a proteomics analysis to uncover the changes in the proteomic landscape um, in the different clusters. So, currently, we are doing um, the analysis or like the data analysis from this for the proteomics result. And we hope it. We hope to bring it. We hope to bring the result to you soon. And with that all together, we in IDEA we are focusing on the different aspects of the differentiation slash development, with the aim to understand human development through SCI islet differentiation process. So we hope, like with these different projects, we create like the building block, and all together, this can be used to further. Um, improve the differentiation protocol to hopefully generate a more uh, a safer SC um, uh, stem cell direct product with improved functionality and safety for future transplantation applications. And with that, I would like to say thank you to our lab, especially Toby, Melis, and Nicole that have graciously allowed me to present a glimpse of their project and to all supporting um, our projects in IDR, thank you. And also to you all, thank you for listening and I will we'll be happy to discuss further. Thank you, Nikkei, for that presentation. Um, first, I'd like to open it up to the, does anyone in the audience have any questions for our presenter? All right, I, I um, have a couple to start things off while we let the audience, uh, well, uh, come up with a few questions for you. First of all, um, I'm just wondering uh, what's next for you and maybe you can talk about some more specific um, important questions uh, that you have um, that you'd like to address regarding the function and safety of stem cell islet-like products. Hmm, haven't thought about that. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think safety so functionality, to be completely honest, when I look at the data, I feel like we have generated the 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 stuff that we are generated is already good enough. I mean, they function eventually in vivo, they function. So I would rather focus on the off targets, actually. Um, I'm really curious about like what, because we know that maybe teratome is not the big problem at the moment. But definitely, there are cell types that are not supposed that are not present in adult pancreatic beta islets. Like if we transplant them long term, how would they function? Like would they affect anything? Not probably not in the short term that we observe them in mouse, but could something happen when we wait for two years, three years? Like 
um, how do they develop over time? And that is definitely a question that's weighing on my mind when we think about transplantation, when we think about using stem cell derived product for um, for patients, basically for type one diabetes patients. So I would really like to and improve basically the the develop uh, the differentiation protocol as much as possible to basically remove this non islet non pancreatic islet as much as possible i think that would be what i want to do after this i i wonder um do you have any comments on work that's been done in other areas where stem cell products are used as far as their quality assure, quality assays, um, their in vitro quality assays, and how these might guide us for islet stem cell-like products? To be completely honest, I don't think I've looked that deep into the other either stem cell or product. I know like, for example, um, Anita Kekabe. Anita? Oh, no, true. Yeah, the from Copenhagen is doing like clinical trials for um, Parkinson's disease, for example, for neurons. Um, uh, but I don't, I'm not aware with their uh, release criteria. Like I know, um, and I'm not aware also for like Fairtex, I don't think they showed any of the release criteria for their products either. So I think this, we really need to be careful um, when eventually if we decide to use stem cell direct product for transplantation, we really need to be careful and really define this release criteria as safe as possible. But for now, I don't, I'm not really um, aware of any um information regarding that thank you all right one last chance if you have a question please unmute yourself or go ahead and put it in the chat box okay well thank you so much for that presentation Nike, and we look forward to hearing more from you and your um colleagues at Helmholtz. Um, I'd just like to mention, um, we have a couple um, interesting Ask the Experts coming up. Um, August 27th, Jeffrey Millman will be speaking about identification of unique cell responses in pancreatic islets to stress. And August 29th, Zia Zhao from UBC uh, has a talk entitled Stem Cell Islet Models Generated with a Tunable Strategy. So both of those may be interesting to you and our audience members, um, and you can register for those on our website. Thanks again, Nikkei, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, uh, look forward to hearing more soon. Bye, thanks.